Okay, okay, no, that's better. That makes me feel better. So thank you for that. Um, good morning. It's great to be here with you guys today. Uh, if you're new, then I just would like to welcome you and say uh, welcome to South Point here. You're gonna, you're kind of jumping in at the end of something that we've been doing, you know, throughout this whole month. Uh, so I'll try my best to kind of bring you up to speed on it. But for those of us that have been around, uh, this is no surprise to you. Uh, we're in a, a series, and we finished it off today, called Heart for the House. And this started last year um, as I was praying for this church, and God began to put things on my heart uh, for the church here. And God said, hey, it's time for you guys to do something where you ask the congregation, the, the members, attenders, visitors, to have a heart for this place and, to, and then to do something about that. And I, I've seen this church change in the last month in just such an amazing way. Uh, I've heard the, the stories, I've seen the messages from WhatsApp, I've, I've gotten the emails, I've heard things from small group leaders, but it, it really appears to me uh, that God has been moving this month and that he's, He has encouraged people, He has impressed on people's hearts. He has, it's just something different is beginning to happen here. It doesn't mean that the season before this was bad, I mean there wasn't anything wrong with that, but it's just something different, something really special is going on here right now. Um, and I think that what's happening is, is this. I think that we've redefined this house through our heart for it. So I've asked us to have a heart for the house. And you guys have had a heart for this house. And through that heart for this house, I believe that we have redefined it. Because I'm seeing things that I had not seen before. For example, we did a, a fast. We did a three-day fast. I was just blown away by the amount of people from the church that fasted with us. And then on Wednesday night, we all got together and we broke the fast together and everybody ate way too much and got sick and it was great. I mean, it was fantastic. Yeah. No, it was good. It was an amazing, uh, it was an amazing time. And we, we haven't done that in a long time or maybe even, even ever to my knowledge. So I, I've just watched us as a church and by us, I mean you guys as well have redefined this house through your heart for it. Now, the big elephant in the room is the ask. So the ask over this month has been that at the end of the month that we pay off the 2.55 million rand debt that we have. That's the building debt. Now, why does this matter uh, for us? Uh, this matters because right now what, we're, what we would hand over to the next generation is, is debt. What we would hand over are, are problems to solve, but we have grown in such an incredible way as a church, and you guys have, have done amazing things. Our kingdom building is growing, uh, small groups are growing, uh, tithe is growing. Everything has just been really, really great, and we've gotten to a level where I say, okay, God, what's next for us? And God spoke to me. He spoke to the elders, and he said, get rid of the debt. Because right now, the debt is the biggest thing that's holding you back from some other things that I would love to be able to do with you guys. And so, you know, when we pay off the two and a half million rand of debt in, uh, let's see, Tuesday morning, I'll wake up and check the bank account. Well, I can't check the bank account. Our finance team will. And they'll, they'll tell me, yep, it's there. We'll pay off the building. It'll be over and it'll be done. And when that happens, that frees up 82,000 rand a month. So what that shows us is that 82,000 rand a month of your tithe is hung up in paying the debt of the building. And when we don't have the debt of the building, then 82,000 rand of the tithe gets to go towards ministry, towards outreach, towards hiring new staff. It gets to go towards growth. It gets to go to a place where you're able to say, hey, Pastor Chris, what if we could do? Or, hey, I've got an idea. I wonder if this would work. And we can see how let's try it. Because we have capacity to be able to try it. So I, I personally, uh, this is not something that I would think of myself, because this is terrifying. But this is what God said. It's what God told us to do. At the beginning of the month, it was really easy to say this from up here. Try being here and say this. And now here we are at the end of the month. And I'm still saying the same thing. But it has gotten a little bit harder. It's tested my faith. And sometimes along the way, this thing has felt um, impossible. But what we've learned is we've learned not to confuse the unexplainable with the impossible. 
So oftentimes what we think is impossible is actually just unexplainable. So let's do a little bit of comparison here. Um, let's pretend that nobody knows Jesus in the room here, and that we're all here for something else. I don't know, for, uh, for a concert or something. But, and we hear about this guy that came, and he came through a, a virgin, uh, and he was born through a virgin. You know, first of all, people are like, man, poor Joseph. She lied, you know. Um, nobody laughed at that. This, okay, chill out, all right? So, so like this, you know, Mary had a baby, and she tells Joseph, I promise, all right, I promise. I've not done anything with anybody else. And an angel tells Joseph, Joseph, it's cool, man. You can trust her. And he's like, okay, I guess I'll trust her. And then they give birth to this baby. And it doesn't look like Joseph, but he's trusting what the angel said. And, and they raise him, and, and he walks on this earth for 33 years. He gets betrayed kind of by his own people, and he gets beaten, and he gets the worst punishment possible, and he gets crucified and put on the cross. And he, he says, hey, in three days after my death, I'm going to rise, and he dies. And then he goes to the tomb, and they put a big rock in front of it. I mean, this is, this is like impossible here. This is the impossible stuff. And then uh, three days later, the stone is rolled away, and Jesus is resurrected. And then he walks around, and he sees hundreds of people post his, his death and post his resurrection. And then he ascends up into heaven. Now, if there was one thing, I think, in history that we could say is, is this is impossible for this to happen, could be impossible, should be impossible. But it wasn't. Instead, it was unexplainable. Same with your sin, uh, with us. You know, if we believe in Jesus and we believe that he forgives us of our sin, the reason that we have a thing uh, called grace is that God is giving us forgiveness for something that we don't deserve forgiveness for. It's impossible that I should be able to get to heaven and, have, uh, a, a, and sit before God. It's impossible that my sinful heart should be able to uh, inter, intertwine with God's perfect heart and God's perfection. Those, that's, that's impossible. But because of the unexplainable, because I'll never be able to fully understand or explain the love of Jesus, He came down and did that whole resurrection thing so that we can have forgiveness of our sins. Now that to me, that, that's unexplainable. It's impossible, it's unexplainable. And then if you compare that to a little bit of debt, it's like that's nothing for God. And we, we look at it and we think that's an impossible ask. And that, God scoffs at that. It's like, man, that's nothing. I sent my son to take your form, to forgive you of your sins, to restore a relationship that you messed up with me so that you could spend eternity with me and you think two and a half million rand's impossible? Come on. It's unexplainable, not impossible. So we, we've ushered in and we said, okay, God, it's unexplainable. I don't ever want what we do here as a church to be explainable. Because then I could say that, hey, I, I, I did this or I caused this or we, put this, we did these things and we can explain everything that we think that God does. There needs to be a lot of unexplainable in the church. And I... I do believe that that's us. You know, you guys want to know how far along we are on paying the debt off? You want to know the number? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the number. You know why? Because I don't care. You know why? Because I want you guys to do what God says and see what God does. And if I, if I tell you a number that I know and I, and I don't know it, then somebody may think, oh, I'm not going to do that. or like, I'm, I'm not here to manipulate you. I'm not here to say, guys, we're, we're, we're 500,000 rand away. Somebody needs to, you know, who's feeling 500,000 rand today? You know, who wants the, who wants the blessing of, you know, of God for your 500,000 rand? No, I, I'm not, I don't have strategy and I'm not worried about it. What I want you to do, I could care less about your money. I could care less about the money uh, that you have that, that would pay off that debt. What I care the most about is that through this month that you have learned to speak with God, to hear from God, and to do what God says, and then watch what He does. That's what I want from you. That's the thing that I care the most about. 
You know, and, and we talked about uh, stewardship a little bit here, and we talked about God providing for us, and it was such a good dismantling of this prosperity gospel, because anytime we talk about money as a church, it comes across as, you know, that whole thing of, you know, give us your blessing, or you give money, we give you a blessing, or the more that you give, you can't outgive God, so the more you give, God will give to you. You know, these are all prosperity gospel things, and I just refuse to, to tell you guys that because it's not true. See, God gives a provision to you and to us. And He gives to each one what He believes they should have. And then that provision is given to you so that, two very important words in Scripture, so that that provision can be sent out and can be given to others. He doesn't give us blessings and provision so that we hold it in here. God doesn't want to impact the world outside the church. He wants to impact the world through the church. He wants to give us blessings. He wants to give us finances. He wants to give us gifts and talents so that we then take that. We don't hold on to it for ourselves. And then we push it out and we bless somebody else with it. One of the things that's kind of rocked my world is this thought that my provision stewarded can be someone else's prayer answered. That's, that's amazing potential. Incredible potential. And we practiced this. If you were here a couple weeks ago, you were given an envelope on your way out the door. And it had a, a sum of money in it. And that envelope was for you to take to God and say, God, what would you have me do? How do I steward this? And you to take that blessing and pray about it and then bless somebody else with that. And that wasn't church money. That was somebody in the church that had a burden, a conviction to help us to practice generosity and help us to practice doing what God says and watching what he does. And there were some amazing stories that came from that. And the other big thing that we've talked about through this series is legacy. This to me is so important, the legacy that we leave behind as, as a church. And I'm not right now like preaching about Jesus. Right now I'm, I'm talking to you. This is your legacy. What comes after you is the legacy that you leave behind. And a legacy is the lasting impact and influence that someone leaves behind after they pass away or they move on. And we get an opportunity to look behind us and see the miracles that God has done and see the impact that God has done through our generosity, through our obedience, through our faith. God, I want to leave this legacy for the next generation. You know, what the next generation looks at us, or when the next generation looks at us, what legacy will they step into? Will they step into a legacy of too big of an ask or too impossible? I'll never forget one time early on, I, I, had a, I had a goal and I was throwing around some ideas and I said something like, hey, this year I'd like to baptize, you know, 20 people this year. And somebody told me, they said, it's not fair for you to give the church an unrealistic number because they'll just get discouraged. And I thought, that's not the legacy we're going to leave here at South Point. So we're not going to look behind and see that we played it safe because I was worried that you would feel discouraged. I don't really care that much about your feelings. Just that's why I don't do a lot of counseling. All right? I don't, actually, I don't care about them that much. I care about you and your relationship with Jesus, but I'm not afraid to bother you. I'm not afraid to, to speak to you and to, to call you out on stuff. I'm also not afraid to love you unconditionally. But what are we going to leave for the next generation? We can leave a, a legacy that challenges and inspires them, or we can leave one full of problems for them to solve. Some of you have a legacy in your family where you're solving problems that the generations before you left you. We can stop that. You can stop that. And that is an oversimplification. I know that there's layers and layers and layers to that. But I know the truth is, is that you can change it. And then the legacy that's behind you is one that challenges and inspires not one with problems to solve. So this whole like debt thing um, really is just an opportunity to leave a challenging and inspirational legacy. You know, part of why I know that this can happen, why I trust God when he said to do this, is because the legacy left behind when they got this building. They got the building, they laid the, the, the church laid the carpet tiles you see, they painted the walls in family ministry, they hung the lights, everything you see up in here was hung by members of the church they laid the flooring out there 
by themselves. I mean, this church was built by the church because there was a group of people, and many of you are still here, that said, we want to leave a legacy of faith, one that challenges and one that inspires. And so here I am now saying, all right, let's, let's do it again. Let's leave something that challenges and inspires. See, this, this next generation, we can talk about this all day long until we're blue in the face. But the next generation, they need to know that we believe it so much that we do it. All right, we, we have to do it. So here's the thing. I, I don't have uh, two and a half million rand in my bank account. Uh, somebody asked me um, if I was going to reach out to some of like our American churches and ask them to give to this. And I was like, nope, not at all. You know, this is ours. This is for you to do. It's not for me to do. I'm doing what God said. God said, get up and, and preach this and talk about this. Lead the church through this. He didn't say, hey, Chris, go come up with two million so the church only has to come up with half a million. He didn't say that because I need to see you do it. And the next generation needs to see, needs to see you, you do it. And you're only going to do it because you believe it so much. And the debt thing is just one, it's just one example. And it's a small example. You know, there, there's so many other examples that the next generation is going to be looking at us and saying, let me see you do it. I want to know that you believe it so much that you will do it. If you work on staff with me, there's a phrase that I hate. I've spoken about this in the services some. I hate the phrase, we need. Did you hate that? Somebody, you know, sitting around and somebody's like, you know what? We need someone to do whatever. We need a better worship environment. Or, you know what? You know what would be great? Uh, we need a, a ministry that does this. Or, like, we, you know, think about, like, at home, sitting around with family. How many times do you hear the phrase, uh, you know, like, we need. We, we need this. We need that. Would, I hate that. Because we need does not have any accountability, and it doesn't have any ownership to it. It's just like, it's just it's like uh, uh, words in the eth. It's just words that just, bleh. we need. We need to get out of debt. Just, bleh. and those words that go out smells like a fart in the wind. It's horrible. All right? Instead, what, what I like is I see a need, and I believe it so much that I will do. It's very different from we need. That's I, I see it, and I believe it. And I will do. That is ownership. That is accountability. Uh, James, I'll just quickly read the first little bit of this here. James, in chapter 1, he says, But prove yourselves doers of the word. He's saying, prove yourselves doers. Actually do. And what he's talking about here is actively and continually obeying God's precepts. So you're actively and continually obeying God's his, his, his commandments, but his also His commandment to love his uh, challenge for us to put our faith in him. The, the precepts are the things that makes God who he is and, and what he's asked us to be as disciples of God. And he's saying, I want you to live that way. I want you to do it. I want you to continually, continually do that. And he says, don't, don't just be a listener, but instead to be a doer. And speaking of, of doing, a, a quote that my wife uh, quoted was, and she leaned in hard on the first service. You guys got it got it uh, a little bit easier on this one here is that that which is optional for one generation is going to be seen as unnecessary for the next generation and she talked about like church attendance here's why this matters uh to me right here i don't i could care less about that well i do care about numbers because heaven is a numbers game there will be a number of souls that go to heaven there will be a number of souls that go to hell so don't tell me church isn't about numbers because for me it is Numbers are people that we can take with us to heaven, that we can ensure and connect to God, that through God they have a relationship with Christ, and when they die, they go to heaven, they don't go to hell. That's, that's, that's what that is. But when we say that church should not be optional, what we're really saying is, is that for this generation, if coming on a Sunday morning is optional, then the next generation, it's easier for them to see it as unnecessary. Because they say, okay, well, mom and dad didn't take me or didn't make us go. 
and it was optional for us. We went when the weather was nice or when this was good or that was good. But now that I'm grown up and I can drive and make my own decisions, like, you know, that thing that was optional is not really necessary uh, to me. And the reason that that bothers me so much is because what we have here, for, we create an area where for an hour, hour and a half, everything that we do here we do so that you can have an encounter with Jesus. That's, that's it. In here and with your children. And if I am to believe that this encounter that you can have with Jesus can be life-changing and can impact you and can impact your family, then I, then I, I pray that this is something that you're at, that you attend because I want you to have that opportunity. And when you look at, at your schedule, you look at your life, and you say, okay, I'm going to fill it up with these other things. What do those other things fill you up with? Because here in church, or with your time with God, that fills you up with something that, fill, that, that fills you up. You fill up your time with God, and God will fill up your heart with Him. That, that's, why, that's why this matters so much to me. Because I don't want a generation to lose that. And this next generation, it means something to me. What is the next generation worth? What's it worth to us? Because if, we, if we're not doers, if they don't see us doing, if they see that things are so optional, then what do they mean to us? Now, I, I believe here, I don't believe, I'm declaring, that the next generation for us is worth everything. And if it's worth everything then we have to do everything that we can, everything that we can for the next generation. And th th this comes with what I hope to celebrate at the end of this month on Tuesday. I don't want to celebrate the amount of money that we have. I, want to, I don't want to celebrate you know, that. What I want to celebrate is that we are a generous and obedient church. That's what's worthy of celebration. Because being, having a heart of generosity, having a heart of obedience, to, to, like the debt that we have is, is nothing. If ungenerous or unobedient people give, pay, pay that off because they need like a tax write-off or something like that, if they're like, you know what, fine, I'll, I'll give that to you. But it doesn't cost you. This is why I don't go to my church, uh, the churches that we have in America. Because if it doesn't cost you then I can't stand up here and celebrate that we are a generous and obedient church. This is why you have to do it, so that I can celebrate your generosity and your obedience, so that your lives can be impacted by becoming gener generous and obedient. Because then from there, we can do a, a, a million different things as a church. What does this take from us? This takes faith. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, faith and we've got a bit of an experience for you guys to to participate in but it takes faith it takes faith to believe in things I have a couple definitions for you faith is not something tangible to be taken like medicine it's an attitude of trusting and believing that's faith it's not something tangible to be taken like medicine it's an attitude of trusting and believing you know what this looks like in my life it's, this looks like, let's just take this month for example. Not knowing, you know, it, 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 God's asked us to pay this debt off and then, you know, me every week saying, oh, it's done. Like, consider it done. But then I go home and I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, man, I want to throw up. What if it doesn't happen? Uh, how far away can I get from Cape Town without people knowing? Can I just <laughs> run away from this right here? And I bring my unbelief and my unfaith to Jesus and, I, and I, make it, I make it right. I take on an attitude of trusting and believing. I don't drink faith juice. You know what faith juice is? It's alcohol. You're afraid to talk to that girl, you know? You drink a, little, a few little, you know, a few beers, and all of a sudden you're, you're indestructible, right? You can talk to anybody in the world. You can do anything in the world, you know? That faith doesn't work that way. Faith is an attitude. And I wrestle every morning with the nature in my heart, and I scoop it out and get rid of it, and I take on an attitude of trusting and believing. I make myself do that every day. I, I want to tell you a story about faith. Um, this is an actual event that, that happened, and we find this in, in Matthew. 
And in Matthew, there's this encounter that Jesus has with the guy, and, and faith is brought up, faith is challenged, the discipleship, or the disciples are part of it here. And what happens is that Jesus had been up on top of a mountain because special things happened on a mountain. Moses went up on a mountain uh, to get the, the Ten Commandments. He saw the burning bush on a mountain. Um, uh, Jesus uh, went up on a mountain with the disciples during this thing called the Transfiguration. And that was where two other... I forgot this in the first service. Uh, my wife's up there going like, two, two, not three, two. So t- two other people appeared with Jesus and... Some of the disciples were there, and they couldn't explain it, and they couldn't figure, you know, figure it out. They didn't know who, who it was, but it, they call that the transfiguration. You can read it in Matthew, uh, the, the chapter right before what, what we're reading here today. And, and that, that was like an impossible thing that, that happened, so it became unexplainable. So they walked down the mountain, and as they walked down the mountain, they come down from that, and they come into a situation here. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of commotion happening. And they walk down into it in the city. And in verse 14, when they approached the crowd, a man came up to Jesus. Man, not disciple, not follower, just a, a dude. Just a regular old guy. All right? The Bible doesn't tell us anything about him. Just that he's just a regular man. And he comes up to Jesus and he kneels before him and he says, Lord. Now he's not recognizing that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Lord. But what he's doing is he's, he's, he's putting Jesus in a place where he's saying, I've heard that you do miracles. I've heard that you're capable of things. So Lord, putting him into a kind of like a place of authority there. So he says, Lord, have mercy on my son. There's the request. And here's why he asked that request. For he is a lunatic, moonstruck, and suffers terribly. For he often falls into the fire, and he often falls into the water. So he's saying, help me with my son. Now here, he does something slick. He throws the disciples under the bus in verse 16. He says, and I brought him to your disciples, and they were not able to heal him. Anyone ever uh, on the phone or in the store said, uh, not gotten what you wanted, and said, let me talk to your manager? That's what, the, that's what this guy's done. He's gone to, to, to the disciples, and they weren't able to do it. And he said, let me talk to the manager. So he's gone to Jesus, said they weren't able to heal him. And Jesus answers, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. He's not just talking about the disciples. He's talking about the Pharisees and everybody that's gathered around. Now, at this point, I want to jump to Mark. Because in Mark, the man and Jesus have more of a conversation. So in Mark chapter 9, verse 22, again, the demon has often thrown him both in the fire and into the water, both intending to kill him. Here's the guy explaining this to Jesus. And he says, but if you can do anything, so he's like, so he's asking Jesus. Now, he doesn't know that Jesus is Jesus. He just knows that, that this is a God that he's called Lord, that he's hoping can do something. He says, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus says to him, you say to me? Yeah, well, hold on a second. Are you, are you, okay, so you're asking me if I can do anything. Okay. All right. You want to you ask me if, if, if you can? And he says, all things are possible. For the one who believes and trusts in me. And then immediately the father's response. The father of the boy cries out with a desperate and piercing cry. Saying, I do believe, but help me overcome my belief. Now this this part right here is so important. This help me overcome my belief. You know, we can go to God and say things like that. I do believe. I do believe you're God. I believe you died on the cross. Yeah, I, I believe that, that like, you, you know, you're in my heart or you're, you're, I pray to you. Like, I believe in you, but actually I have so much unbelief in my life. So help me with my unbelief. Help, my, help me overcome it. And then we jump back to Matthew. And Matthew says that, that Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And the boy was healed at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately. And they asked him, okay, tell us. Tell us, Jesus, we tried really, really hard. Tell us the secret. Must have been something, you know, must have been something to it. My dad used to tell me uh, when I was trying to fix something or like if a screw was stuck and I was trying to unscrew something or work on something, 
I'd be like, I, I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to do this. And he'd say, like, well, you got to hold your mouth right. And that was his, you know, you're going to make like a certain, like, you know, like a dad face. Like a, you know, it's like, well, you're not fixing it because you don't hold your mouth right. So as a little kid, I'd, you know, try and get it to. So the disciples come to Jesus and say, okay, how'd you do it? And they go privately because they, they don't want to, like, do this in front of the crowd. Jesus, how'd you do it? Come on. What's the secret here? Because we, we couldn't do it. They said, why could we not drive him out? Jesus answered, so simple. He answered, because of your little faith. Little faith. Your lack of trust and confidence in the power of God. That's why you couldn't do it. Because you had little faith. And then Jesus teaches them something so important. He says, for I assure you, and I most solemnly say to you, if you have living faith, the size of a mustard seed. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and if it's God's will, it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. See, right here we have a mustard seed. It's the same mustard seed that Jesus was talking about, the black mustard seed. Can you guys see that? No, there's not a chance. Not a chance. Can you, can you hold on, everybody listen. Shh. Did you hear that? No, it's too small. So Jesus is saying, O oh, you of little faith, O oh, you of little faith, if you could have the faith of a mustard seed, the size of a mustard seed. See, he's not saying, O oh, you of little faith, if you could have titanic faith. O oh, you of little faith, I'm asking you to, to have bowling ball faith. Say, O oh, you of little faith, if you were to have the faith of a little mustard seed, and see, this is the smallest seed that was produced in the, in the region there. It's the smallest thing that Jesus could have used. And he compared it to a mountain. He compared it to, to moving a mountain. And in the culture in that day, a mountain was, was kind of, when a mountain was used in a phrase, it was used to kind of signify like the, the solidity of something. Like it wasn't going to change, wasn't going to be moved. And so what Jesus is saying and he's saying, if you take the smallest, most insignificant thing and you put it up against the most significant thing where the most special things happen on top of the mountain where, 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 where the, the, the mountain is this unmovable, unmovable thing, and if you put this up against that, this wins. This, this little thing that you can't even hear wins. So that phrase... Um, Lord, help me with my unbelief. We're going to have a chance to do that today. So at the four corners of the room, uh, there's a dish, and in the dish, there's mustard seeds. And Jesus is saying, I want you to have the faith, if you had the faith of a mustard seed. And I think that, um, that a lot of us don't have that faith, me, me, I mean, me included here. But it takes me back to the man that said, help me with my unbelief. So I believe, but help me with my unbelief. So I, I want us to I want to help you with your unbelief today. And so what you're gonna get a chance to do is we're gonna play a video that we played at the beginning of the series. And uh, you're gonna sit and just watch that and think, and I'm gonna be praying that God speaks to you. And then when we worship, you're gonna have a chance to get up and, and move. Uh, but what I want you to think about in your life is what do you need help believing for? What would you tell God right now or Jesus right now? I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. And that thing that you want help with your unbelief, I want you to take one mustard seed for whatever that thing is. And I want you to put it, we have a little a communion cup. I want you to just put it in the cup. So these aren't things that you have mustard seed faith for. These are things that you're declaring, God, help me with my unbelief. I desire to have the faith the size of a mustard seed so that I can move this mountain in my life. I don't know what your mountain is. I don't know what your un immovable, impossible thing is. But this morning when I woke up, I sat down and I asked God to help me with my unbelief. I have four things. And I put my... Four things in my cup. 
Say, God, help me with my unbelief. So that's the opportunity that you have. is for you to ask God, where do I need help with my unbelief? And for you to drop your mustard seed in the little communion cup. And we're going to watch a video uh, right now. Um, it's one we used at the beginning of the, of the series. And I want you to just sit and watch and think and maybe be inspired. And then after that, the band's going to come out and lead us in a, a song of, of worship. And I want everybody that's heard from God, hopefully everybody, but I want everybody that is brave enough, and I hope that you are, to make your way to a table and to grab your mustard seed for your thing or your one thing or two things or three things, however many mustard seeds you need, and to dump it in your cup and say, yes, help me with my unbelief. This is what I'm putting my mustard seed faith in. So let me pray for us before we... um, turn our eyes to the movie here. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just reveal yourself to everybody in the room, that you would speak, and that you would give everybody a very, very, very clear uh, answer, that they would know, okay, this is, I know, okay, I've been afraid to put my faith in this, and so now I'm going to take a step out, and I'm going to say, Lord, help me with my unbelief, and I'm going to pick up a mustard seed and drop it in the cup. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Guys, if I just would invite everybody to, uh, before you stand, sorry, to turn your eyes to the screen right now. Hi, I'm Pastor Chris, and I shouldn't be, but it wasn't up to me. See, I found this church, or rather it found me, and I started to understand that, like me, it shouldn't be. South Point Church is the church of the shouldn't be. We shouldn't be here. We shouldn't have survived COVID, and we shouldn't have kept this moment. We shouldn't have kept and gave the people we have. We shouldn't have been elders, leaders, and pastors that we have. We shouldn't have the groups and volunteers that we have. We shouldn't have seen the baptisms and salvation that we have. We shouldn't have seen the thousands of hours of ministry moments that we have. We shouldn't have paid off a million rand in debt and given a million rand care like we have. We are the church of the shouldn't be because none of what we have in art should be. We shouldn't have seen new people being added to the community. We shouldn't have the rainy day fund, the nest egg, and the financial stability. We shouldn't have witnessed the healing of bodies and relationships and renewed immunity. We shouldn't have seen the renewals of hopes and dreams of promises of peace and security. We shouldn't have seen strongholds torn down, people set free in a partnership with angels and unity. We are the church of shouldn't be, because none of what we have in our life should be. Now we stand in a new place, still a place we should not be. Culture, society, the world, the algorithm has already defined what should and should not be. But we've made a habit of finding ourselves in places we should not be. We should not be a church to go home and a family to hold your own because everybody else thinks that belonging isn't that easy anywhere else. We should not be a safe place for anyone, and I mean anyone, to have a safe encounter with Jesus because everyone else thinks there is a certain something and a certain someone you have to be or before you preach up and show up. We shouldn't be a church where those who don't know God want to get to know God. That's absurd. But you see, the world gets love and absurdity confused. The world doesn't yet see it's not love or absurdity, but rather it's being absurdly love that should be. We are a church of the shouldn't be because none of what we have in our should be. Now we stand in a new place, this time a place that we should be. We should come to expect that we are exactly where we are, positioned as we are for what we are and for who we are because we are never needed to be anything they said we should be. We should see the lost come and be found. The saved should be renewed and resound with worship and praise for God because we never had to be. We should see the broken healed, the lame walk, their face be sealed in a love so grandly revealed. That God would give himself, creating in space the man, the only man who had anything to be. When God became man, the world received all that needed to be. Now we see why it's okay to be a church of shouldn't be. None of what we have and our should be. Church, it's because of this man that we are not done being what the world says we should not be. It is because of this man that I have a heart that will not stop beating. And as long as it beats, I will beat the walls of the strongholds that hold captive our communities. It is because of this man that these hearts that shouldn't be will imprint and be imprinted by this house, this community that is South Point Church. And this heart for this house will make a new way for hearts and houses across our city. This year, we will not worry about what should and should not be, what makes sense, what is obtainable, what is reasonable. Because when we chase what makes sense, what's obtainable and reasonable, we don't even come close to what that man unreasonably laid his life down for. I say we start chasing what seems unreasonable, unobtainable, and insensible with our renewed and divinely appointed hearts for this house. 
If we run forward in faith with arms stretched out wide, we might find that a church that shouldn't be reflects a love that shouldn't be, miracles that shouldn't be, and a heart for a house that shouldn't be. We are a church that shouldn't be because none of what we have in our should be. Now, I just want to encourage you guys uh, right before the band starts, don't let fear keep you from grabbing a mustard seed. Don't let fear of maybe I won't be able to believe, maybe it won't stick or maybe it won't matter. Don't think about it. Don't overthink it. But the next six minutes could be a kickstart to change in your life. Don't let fear steal that away from you. So when they start, we're all going to stand, and that's when I want you guys to move. Don't be afraid. Just move. First service, we had everybody in the room moved. So this is your chance here. Don't let fear take it from you. Guys, stand as we worship. Let's go ahead and bring our, our, our mustard seeds up front. We've got some volunteers on on that. Uh, I, I want to bring them up front and I want to uh, just drop them in this, um, in this uh, uh, glass here. So they're just going to bring those here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay. Oh, we got more. Fantastic. Well done. Well done, church. Um, so what I see when I look at this right here is I see the faith that we build this church on in the next season. From this season forward, here's our faith, you know? And this to me is unbelievably encouraging because I see a bunch of people that said, God, help me with my unbelief. And through our faith, I believe that what we have done is we have redefined our faith through our heart for Him. By recognizing and understanding a little bit about Jesus and about how he says, put your faith in me and watch what happens. And then you guys have. So I, I look at this and I believe that this is an amazing thing to build on. God, God, God could have done it with just one. He could have just had one seed in the jar and I would have been just as happy. But we got a bunch here. So well done, church. Well done for putting your faith in Jesus. Well done for saying, God, help me with my unbelief. I, I'm going to pray over every mustard seed that's in here. And then we're going to dismiss. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for every person that put a, a mustard seed in the cup. I pray, Lord, over every seed, Father. We're just asking that you help us with our unbelief. Uh, we believe in you, God, but help us with our unbelief. And in this cup are very dear and very, very, very precious, very precious requests of faith. And I thank you, Father, that people took a step forward and put this in here. And so, Lord, I pray that you are going to reveal yourself to everybody that dropped a mustard seed in and everybody that didn't that you'll show that you will help us with our unbelief. God, you're a mighty, mighty good God. And I can't wait to step into our next season with the people of faith that we have in this room. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.